Good morning. Welcome to Melville. It is good to be together to worship God this morning. Today is, uh, could have been last week, but we're using this week. Today we are marking Healing and Reconciliation Sunday. It is a Sunday falling close to Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, Healing and Reconciliation Sunday was designated by the 2006 General Assembly, recognizing the need for healing and relationship building between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in Canada. And as a church that ran 12 residential schools, we bear collective responsibility to truth and healing. In the 1980s and 1990s, the truth about the abuses that children suffered at residential schools began to be heard, and we continue to hear those stories today, and we continue to learn more. We'll be talking about this throughout the service uh, today, and the 2024 General Assembly has adopted a new apology um, regarding the residential school system, and so we'll be hearing that today as well. Uh, June 3rd marked 30 years since the church adopted its 1994 confession, and so now 30 years later, we have a public statement of apology. As we gather for worship this morning, we acknowledge that the land on which this church is built, the land where many of us live and work, is the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of Scugog, Hiawatha, and Alderville First Nations, and the Métis Nation. This territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. It is land which falls under the Williams Treaty of 1923. We acknowledge the importance of land to our Indigenous siblings for the life-giving uh, realities of land and water and for the sense of identity that it brings our Indigenous siblings. We give thanks for their enduring presence on this land and we commit ourselves to the continuing work of healing and reconciliation through listening and learning together. Would you please stand for the call to worship? Loving God, you call us all together. You call us to worship as the people of God. You call us by name and just as we are. You know each of our needs. You know our experiences. You know what rests in our minds and our hearts. And in your love, you call us. You call us to worship as the people of God. God invites us to worship as beloved and loving people. We come to worship our Creator united as God's people. Let us pray. God of creation, everything you have made sings your praises. Let our voices join the song and proclaim your goodness, your grace, your justice, and your fulsome peace. With Jesus as our example, let our words become actions that reflect your will for the thriving of all people and all creation. May your spirit of love flow abundantly into every corner of the world. Creator God of love and justice, comforter of those who mourn, we turn to you acknowledging the actions of your church, our complicity in running residential schools and taking children from their families. We have asked forgiveness and committed to work for truth, healing, and reconciliation. But we recognize that for some, that change came too late. The names of more of the students who died and never made it home from residential schools are beginning to be known. But we know these lists are incomplete, that there will be more names and that some names may never be publicly known. But you know, loving and healing God, their names, their stories, their hearts, and their families. For those children whose names we do know, those we do not yet know, and for intergenerational harm, the trauma still present today that grew from their absence, we apologize. We pray for the healing for siblings, family, and friends of those who were taken from home and did not return. 
for the intergenerational impacts that the schools continue to cause today in families and communities. For where there was joy and we took it, laughter, laughter and we stifled it, play turned to tears, family broken, dignity stripped. We repent and renew our commitment to walk a new path. We honor the children lost and hold the memory of their lives in our hearts. Comforting God, we pray for healing in the communities and families of all who experienced residential schools and strength for all who pursue healing, truth, and reconciliation. Amen. Our responsive psalm is number 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding but must be controlled by bit and bright brittle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but when the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous sing, all, of who, all you who are upright in heart. Children of God, hear the good news. When we confess our brokenness, when we come before God with all that we are and all that we fail to be, with all that we have done and all that we have failed to do, our God in his mercy through his son, Jesus Christ, is quick to forgive, always gracious and loving, the place we find true healing and wholeness. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Thanks be to God. As we come to hear the word of God, let us pray. Help us to listen well, O oh God. Speak to us and help us to hear. Give us your wisdom through your Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we thank Naomi for sharing with us the word of God. The reading today is 1 John 1, verses 5 to 10, and then 2, verses 1 to 2, and it is found on your pew, in your pew Bibles on page 1183. First John 1, 5 to 10. Walking in the light. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live in the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, 
we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. And chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. You'll notice that both our psalm today and our reading from 1 John emphasize the importance of acknowledging our sin before God, but also before one another. And the church continues to do that in various ways. The church continues to acknowledge the many ways that our actions alongside government policies have caused irreparable damage in our Indigenous communities. And we are, though not the initial perpetrators of those actions, we continue to exist within a system that continues to cause harm and continues to uphold colonial values and ideals. And so as a church, we continue to learn and we continue to share and we continue to listen. So today uh, we have a new apology and uh, for something a little bit different, I'm going to read portions of the report that came to General Assembly this year. This report was adopted um, on June 3rd, on the 30th anniversary of our initial confession in 1994. Um, and the following day, I might be off by a day, the following day after it was accepted, it was officially offered by the National Church. Um, I had hoped to show the, the video of the apology as uh, it was recorded um, in part that day, but given our current tech uh, problems, you're going to have me reading it for you instead. So what I'm going to offer this morning is a bit of the preamble and a bit of the explanation for why we came to a renewed apology um, as opposed to our 1994 confession. And then I'm going to invite you to stand um, as we listen to the apology itself together. It's very wordy and it's very heavy. So we do have slides so that if you, just listening is not helpful for you, um, just the words of the apology will be on the screen. But let me give you a bit of um, preamble first to understand how we kind of got here. In 2023, the National Indigenous Ministries Council put forward a recommendation to the General Assembly that the Presbyterian Church in Canada draft a renewed apology for its role in colonization and the operation of residential schools. The recommendation was approved and following this is, came the report of the special committee that was constituted to take on the task of drafting the apology. And the special committee was comprised of members that were appointed by the NIMC. So indigenous voices were part of the committee. They were also members of the Life and Mission Agency. The moderator, um, Mary Fontaine, joined by correspondents and Justice Ministry staff also supported them. There were representatives from across Canada doing this work. The discussion and the content of the apology was framed within the context of the following questions. Why an apology now? Why do we need it? What is distinct about an apology and what is different about what we're doing now and what was done in the 1994 confession? The group noted that an apology must be set in the context of accountability. In answering these questions over the course of its work, the committee discussed the ongoing traumatic impacts of residential schools on survivors and inter intergenerational survivors. It heard and acknowledged that neither the words apology nor sorry 
appeared in the 1994 confession the church made regarding colonization and residential schools, and so agreed that this was not so much a renewed apology as it is the first apology. That is one of the distinctions between the 1994 confession and the apology presented now 30 years later. The committee noted that when the confession was approved by the General Assembly in 94, many people, even within the church, were not ready to hear it, and the church has been slow to embody the sorrow and work for change it confessed then. The original confession did set the church on a path of reconciliation, but in learning to walk that path, the church has learned much about and understands more deeply now the harm that it caused. This apology comes out of the church's learning and is a response to that learning. We cannot but be deeply sorry when we understand the harm that was caused. It was noted that this work is needed for future generations, but for Indigenous members of the group in particular, it comes with an especially heavy personal cost. The special committee also heard that many Indigenous communities who were directly impacted by residential schools operated by the PCC did not know about the 1994 confession or hadn't heard it. So the committee noted that the church needed to find ways to ensure that those towards whom this apology is directed are able to hear it. The special committee also heard and acknowledged how the apology could reopen wounds in communities and for survivors and intergenerational survivors. And so it was also noted that the apology when it is delivered should be done carefully and in ways that respect communities' needs for safety and healing. The special committee heard the need for urgency amid the crises facing indigenous peoples today, the loss of elders and children, language, families, and communities torn apart. Members of the group asked, how do you put a heavy heart into words? They examined elements of apology, including admitting wrongdoing, reparation, commitments going forward, and ongoing change. Members named the critical importance of follow-up steps, including the need to have an intentional and concrete plan for the apology to be shared with those who were hurt by the schools. I'll read the introduction to the apology, and then I'll invite you to stand. We, the Presbyterian Church in Canada, humbly offer this apology to the generations of Indigenous people and communities harmed by the residential schools and day schools we operated. We originally made a confession in 1994 for our role in operating residential schools and colonization, but we have realized the inadequacy of that confession. We apologize for our slowness and the apathy of our response. We are deeply sorry. We acknowledge the families whose children were taken to schools without telling their families where they were being taken and who never returned, who remain lost today. We acknowledge with grief the many unmarked graves that have been found and will be found, including at schools that we ran. We remember the children who never made it home. We apologize for the impact of the genocide of colonization, forced assimilation, and racism to which we actively contributed. Many survivors and intergenerational survivors have shared very personal and traumatic experiences in the context of Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings and within the congregations, committees, and governing bodies of the church. We acknowledge the strength and courage of survivors for sharing their experiences in the schools and the heavy burdens that they, their families, and communities still bear. We acknowledge the pain and difficulty of sharing and reliving the truth of their lived experience. We acknowledge that the church's apology itself, as well as the presence of church representatives making the apology, may be triggering, evoking trauma for some by surfacing memories of devastating experiences in residential schools. Would you please stand if you're able? We acknowledge that Indigenous children suffered at residential schools. The Presbyterian Church in Canada ran Ahuzat Residential School in British Columbia, Alberni Residential School in British Columbia, Bertel Residential School in Manitoba, Cecilia Jeffrey Residential School in Ontario, Cecilia Jeffrey School in Kenora, 
Crow Stand Residential School in Saskatchewan, File Hills Residential School in Saskatchewan, Moscow Patung, later known as Lakes End Residential School in Saskatchewan, Portage La Prairie Residential School in Manitoba, Regina Industrial School in Saskatchewan, Round Lake Residential School in Saskatchewan, and Stony Plain Residential School in Alberta. We apologize for taking children from their homes, parents, grandparents, and communities. We apologize for traumatizing parents and communities and taking away their rights to protect their children. We honor and respect the languages of the land and apologize for punishing Indigenous students for speaking their traditional languages. We apologize for attempting to eliminate Indigenous identity and cultural and spiritual traditions. We apologize for the abuse Indigenous children suffered, including physical, sexual, psychological, emotional, and spiritual abuses. We apologize for the weaponization of food that happened in the schools and for non-consensual experiences with food, nutrition, and medical procedures that were conducted on children. We apologize for the lost lives, for children who died while at residential schools, from disease, neglect, suicide, attempts to run away, and from violence by teachers, staff, and volunteers. We apologize that the schools created an isolated and unsafe environment where violence was condoned and students learned violence. We regret and are deeply sorry that we provided conditions where students could abuse other students. We acknowledge and apologize for the resulting loss of bloodlines, of ancestors and of people who would not grow to become elders, the huge loss of culture and future for nations this meant. We apologize that when children died, their parents were not always informed. They were not always returned to their communities and their burial sites were sometimes unmarked or the markers were not maintained and the record of names was not kept. We apologize for the church's attitude of white superiority, for its assimilating policies and practices, for the racism of treating indigenous people as less than human and for the ongoing intergenerational effects of our complicity with colonization and the schools that continue to negatively impact families and communities. We acknowledge that this systemic racism continues to impact Indigenous people, including through insecure housing, poverty, forced dependence on social assistance, experiencing lateral and domestic violence, in particular towards Indigenous women, girls, and two SLGBTQ people, as named in the final report of the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. We acknowledge that this has led to hopelessness, mental health crises, and the tragedy of suicide, barriers to completing education and to accessing health care. We acknowledge this has led to the breakdown of family bonds that results in children taken into foster care, gang involvement, exploitation, addictions, and incarceration. We are sorry for how long it has taken for the Presbyterian Church in Canada to begin to understand the depth of harm we have caused, and we still have much to learn. For our complicity in colonization and the residential school system, we are deeply, deeply sorry. We therefore offer five fundamental commitments. We will continue to listen and learn from Indigenous people, leaders, elders, and knowledge keepers welcoming and engaging voices from both within and beyond the Presbyterian Church in Canada. We will continue to work the work of reconciliation, responding to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls to action and the work of reparation that we have begun. We will respect traditional Indigenous spiritual practices. We will listen to and tell the truth about the past. We will work to support Indigenous-led healing and wellness initiatives and be in solidarity with Indigenous people and communities. I invite you to join me in a moment of silent reflection.
In adopting this new apology, or as the report states, truly our first apology, um, the General Assembly also resolved that it ought to be translated not only into French and Korean, which are the other languages that we typically translate things into for the church, but also into at least six, seven indigenous languages, which are the languages spoken in the communities that are directly affected by the residential schools that we operated. Um, this includes Dakota, Ojibwe, Soto, Plains Cree, Southern Wakishan, and Central New Chenoth, um, and other languages as required um, in consultation with the Native Ministries Council. Um, and we are further encouraged to continue to study this apology to deepen our understanding of it and of the need for ongoing reconciliation and decolonization as a church and as individuals together. God of truth, because we are imperfect, so too are the societies, communities, and relationships we build. Selfishness and arrogance in our relationships do not reflect your love and have too often hurt your creation and your beloved people therein. We know that wounds inflicted because of false beliefs about the superiority of people of a particular race, class, or gender do not reflect your love for all people, nor your commandment to love you and to love our neighbors. We acknowledge that even if we did not directly inflict, inflict these wounds, we have inherited wounded relationships and that diminishing, ignoring, or denying this continues our complicity in a cycle of harm. We pray for those who are hurt and hurting because of false beliefs about the superiority of a particular race, class, or gender. God, let equity and justice bring healing. We hold in our hearts today those who are sick, or who have loved ones that are struggling with physical or mental illness. Lord, assure them that they are not alone. Jesus, bring your comfort, comfort, justice, and peace. Hear us today as we pray for Stacy and Amelie and the rest of Eleanor's family and friends. Hear us as we give thanks for her life and the way that her love touched so many. We pray for June as she continues to recover and to rest. We thank you for the care which she receives and for the healing that you have worked in her. Hear our prayers for people who face violence in their relationships, in their homes, in their workplaces, their communities, or their country. For those who've been displaced by war, unjust economic systems, climate change, and ongoing impacts of colonization around the world. Spirit, bring your comfort, justice, and peace. In these difficult times, we remember those who live with housing insecurity, where home is inadequate for the needs of the people it must shelter, for unsafe conditions, for places where housing is unaffordable and inaccessible. Creator, bring your comfort, justice, and peace. Hear our prayers for those who are struggling with economic insecurity, where there are barriers to education or employment, unfairness in policies or practices, for those undergoing transition and change. Redeemer, bring your comfort, justice, and peace. We pray for the people at the front lines, that daily face the evidence of systemic racism and continue to strive for the safety and dignity of your people and of the whole creation. Holy fire, bring your comfort, justice, and peace. God of transforming love, we acknowledge that the wounds of racism continue to this day, embedded in the fabric of our institutions and governments. Let your compassion and wisdom flow through all public policies and practices. Where power is hoarded, bring your justice. Where racism is resisted, bring your courage and strength to acknowledge and address it. Hear us as we pray for decision makers and change makers, 
as we make space to hear stories, and as we listen attentively for ways that we might respond. We give thanks today for all people who lift up the integrity and dignity of creation and seek to protect human rights. For those who continually draw our attention to all created in your image. Lord, be with us as we continue to seek reconciliation with you and with each other. Acknowledging that it is not work that we do perfectly, and yet it is work we commit to with your help. Hear us as we pray this day, in Jesus' name, amen. As we go out today, may the Spirit rouse in each of us minds prepared to be unsettled, hearts that yearn for justice, and bodies that work for peace. Guide and impassion us in love and justice to walk lightly and humbly and seek truth and reconciliation, healing and wholeness. In this work, may God's transforming love flow freely through each of us. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.